Welcome back to the next segment of our interview with Dr. Leo Panitch, Professor of Political Science at York University in Toronto, and author of American Empire and the Political Economy of International Finance. Thanks for joining us again, Leo. Hi, Paul. So let's, let's revisit this question of how did we get to this crisis and what immediate things could people be demanding in terms of solution? Well, in, in terms of uh, how the mass of Americans got into this crisis, I think it does go back to the fact that in the 1970s there was a fundamental switch from trying to integrate the workers and the poor people of America into American society, into the riches of American consumers. And maybe just to give some context, especially for some of the younger people in our audience, and there were cities burning in 1960. Well, exactly. the civil rights movement, you had workers demonstrating for their rights and for higher wages. That this, the, the entire society in North America was in, at a state of intense conflict. Yes, and, and you were sending off uh, young black men, conscripting them and sending them off to the Vietnam War. Uh, there was the Black Power Movement. Uh, and the response more under Lyndon Johnson than under Kennedy was to create the War on Poverty or what was known as the Great Society Programs, which involved increasing public expenditure. At the same time as you were prosecuting the war in Vietnam at great expense. Uh, and, and that was part of the period of inflationary pressures that public deficits were causing, that workers' wage demands were causing. Because when workers had full employment, they, you know, felt they could high, make high wage demands in order to be able to buy everything that they were being told to buy that the good life was all about. Uh, and, and the response in the 1970s, and it was a product of the fact that the United States dollar was the world currency, and all here was the rest of the world holding dollars, and they didn't want their dollars to be devalued by inflation, were demanding of the United States that they cut back on their public expenditure. Uh, and they did. Uh, you and talk they, about cut back, they cut back on it. You talk about the Volcker shock treatment. They cut back on it even before that, even under Jimmy Carter in 1976, 77. Uh, and they cut back on public expenditure, but they still had to try to integrate the masses in the cities. They still had the problem of how do you house people. And one of the things they did was to try to integrate them through getting them into the financial system as borrowers. Uh, a act which a lot of radicals were pushing, and they didn't mean it in a way that would end up in this crisis that we're now in, was that banks ought to be required to lend to poor people. That they had to lend to those portions of their communities they'd never lent to. Right? And the banks all objected. What do you mean? We can't lend to poor people. We're not going to be sure we're going to get paid back. They said, okay, we'll allow Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the government-sponsored mortgage housing corporations, to create this secondary market in mortgages. They'll buy them off you. When the, when the Republicans now critique this, they leave out the extent of which there was social unrest that had to be dealt with. Well, and they leave out the fact that this was actually a poor option uh, relative to the Great Society programs, that it was happening because they were cutting back on, the, on welfare, on the Great Society programs, on food stamps, on public expenditure in the cities, etc. So in a sense, they drove people. Right. into, okay, you want to deal, you want to be able to buy in our society, get it from the banks. And Clinton made it worse. Having bought into neoliberalism as all part of the third way, I mean, partly he said, I'm being driven into this because of some, and he used a word we can't use on television, blank, 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 28-year-old bond trader. Right? But once he did, he cut back on welfare. He did away with the American welfare system, Clinton. Right. And what he then did was he radicalized this Community Reinvestment Act, radicalized it in the sense of pushed people further into trying to get mortgages through this. Right. And this created it even more. And then Bush came in and let every shyster in the mortgage system into this as a competitor, completely unregulated, removed the reserve requirements on uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who, you know, banks have a 10% reserve requirement that they have to hold as cash. They only have to have two and a half. Two and a half percent rather than ten, and you got this mountain of, of debt. It isn't the poor people's fault. It's a product of not being willing to have public expenditure. It's a scandal that the United States doesn't have a massive program of public housing. So they could have had two strategies here. One is state investment in public, cheap public housing, direct, get people to borrow money, get into debt to somehow buy their own housing. Exactly, and they pushed it through the private sector. They pushed it through private finance. 
And, they, and, of and course, they, it was and, the and weakest portion. They make money on both system. sides here. They make money on the interest on the debt, and they make money through the asset inflation in the real estate market. Yeah, until it all blows up in their faces. Until it all blows up. Uh, so, you know, in terms of what is to be done, we need to look at it historically. Uh, sure, there needs to be regulation. Sure, the Bush administration should not have allowed every shyster in the mortgage industry in. I, I can't resist no. doing a Sarah Palin here. Doggone, you want to look back again, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Yeah, well, we do. I mean, we need to learn the mis lessons from the mistakes of the past. Um, and so we need to go back to public expenditure. Now, I think it is true that, you know, uh, this is a capitalist system, and, and that will itself create contradictions. Uh, so down the road, you have to be able to think ambitiously about being prepared for what's going to happen if you're doing redistributive taxation in order to raise that money. Uh, if you're pushing out the private sector through public expenditure, uh, what's going to happen in the long run? And I think you have to build support during that process of public expenditure for actually taking the public, the banking system into public hands, now the other making that a public utility. That, you can't do that right now, uh, apart from a bailout. Uh, but I think there's enough anger around that you could be building towards it, not just as a bailout, but as this will become a way of redistributing uh, what is produced in our society in a more rational, more equitable way. You will have a, a banking system that serves a different function. And then the other issue uh, raised by, uh, I interviewed Chalmers Johnson the other day, and he was saying, he wrote a piece recently called, We Have the Money. And he talked about this recent Pentagon budget, which is over $600 billion. Sure. Uh, that, that in fact right now if you could just reallocate some of the military budget to civilian expenditure and infrastructure you could solve it you could solve some of it rather quickly both through increasing taxes on those who haven't paid uh, through introducing a massive wealth tax and through reducing the military budget and and uh, this goes back again to the 60s the Vietnam expenditure on uh, the Cold War expenditure Reagan's enormous inflation of military expenditure just when he was calling for you know, reducing government spending. There's been a tremendous misallocation of funds. And I must say, one of the things that's most scary about Obama and uh, Biden's buying into the threat from Russia and the threat from Iran and the threat from Pakistan is it creates the basis of continuing this kind of increased military expenditure. Uh, apart from whatever misjudgments may be involved, and I think there are many, uh, and, and I find that very worrying in terms of what is needed. You need a reallocation of state funding, of state expenditure, a massive kind. Well, I guess we'll find out whether the, the reality of this crisis pierces some of the mythology of, of the military, of, behind the need for militarization. We well, certainly hope so. Yeah. So thank you for joining us, and let's Good do it again soon. And thank you for joining us. We'll be, of course, continuing our conversations and analysis of the financial crisis in the coming days as we head towards a Canadian and a U.S. presidential election.